Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome here today at the online masterclass of uh, Dr. Khaled Baba on the topic, how to survive the next crisis. Um, before I hand over to Mr. Uh, Baba, there are a few things I would like to mention up front. Uh, please keep your microphone muted during the whole session. This way we can avoid any background noise. Uh, if you have a question, please use the check for a chat fan functionality. At the end of the session, uh, Dr. Waba will try to answer as many uh, questions as possible. Um, furthermore, this online masterclass will be recorded. All the participants will receive the recording plus the slides uh, tomorrow of, or early uh, next month. And uh, next week, I'm sorry. So now I would like to hand over to um, Mr. Waba. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wendy. It, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Uh, yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to be with you today to introduce uh, the topic uh, that I selected uh, to uh, discuss with you today, which is how to survive the next crisis, uh, although we, start, we still are living in the current crisis. Uh, think proactive, think system, and be ready. So let me first uh, introduce myself very quick here. Um, um, I'm, I'm a background of my, my education. I'm an engineer. I graduated from systems and biomedical engineering department at Cairo University in Egypt. I received my BSc and MC from Cairo University uh, from Egypt. And then I went uh, to uh, Germany to get my PhD from Aachen University. And currently, I am the academic dean of Maastricht School of Management in Kuwait. Uh, I'm obviously adjunct faculty as well at the Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands, teaching a couple of courses like digital transformation, decision-making tools, research methodology. Uh, currently, I'm uh, located um, uh, as a, in, in Canada. Uh, I'm part-time faculty at uh, two universities in Ontario, uh, Algoma University, as well as University of Toronto in engineering department. Um, I designed my uh, presentation today uh, around four main topics. Definitely the main topic is crisis. And then I'm gonna talk about the life cycle of any business. And then uh, I want to talk about something. I feel like it's, uh, um, we don't really talk much about it, which is the time. And then I'm talking about systems. Uh, so um, when it comes to crisis, oh, oh. Uh, Sorry, here. Uh, when it comes to crisis, let me go back here. Uh, when it comes to crisis, I will talk about definition, about its traits, some responses, uh, and uh, some, what are the causes for crisis. And then I'm gonna move on and talk about the main four episodes about life cycle, and I will make this connection between life cycle and what's happening during crisis and before, uh, and even after. So I'm gonna really go to zoom in and zoom out around life cycle to show you different perspective. And then uh, I will move on to talk about uh, the very important uh, constructs I, uh, which I feel like uh, it's not being talked about while it's uh, very important, while we are living already in time domain, but we don't have time to talk about time. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it as, uh, and I will make a little bit of funny, uh, uh, comparison between time and storage. Uh, then I will uh, talk about um, the statement that we always use, uh, time is money, uh, or maybe we should say money is time. Uh, we're gonna talk about the virtual time expansion. Then in order to make my point today, I need to, um, to make a link between the system concept, the system theory, and the crisis. Uh, so in systems, I'm, I'm gonna uh, share with you a couple of uh, uh, important elements of systems like uh, uh, feedback loops, delays, and archetypes. And definitely one of the main issue today is called carrying capacity. Um, I selected this slide and this phrase uh, to start with, uh, with my uh, uh, talk today. And it's coming definitely from the very well-known Darwin. Uh, when uh, he mentioned here, it is not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that it is most adaptable to change. And uh, I highlight definitely the word adaptable because it became very, very important 
term today, everyone is uh, using uh, some synonyms, but more or less they are referring to adaptability. So being resilient or being even, uh, um, or working uh, through agile system, it's all about adaptability. Um, another very interesting uh, statement being said, and it's kind to uh, Herbert Spencer, uh, another uh, British uh, uh, sociologist and the philosopher, when he said survivor of the fittest. So this statement uh, coins back to him. And he was inspired by the work uh, of uh, Darwin, and um, he wanted to rephrase part of uh, Darwin's uh, statement when Darwin said uh, that organisms best adjusted, again, adjusted as uh, to adapt to their environment are the most successful in surviving and reproducing. Uh, Spencer wanted to rephrase it in his own words when he said in Darwinian terms, the phrase is best understood as survival of the form that will leave the most copies of itself in successive generations. So you can see the terms that being used in these two slides are very, very important and very relevant to my talk today. Um, when I talk about crisis, um, yeah, we need to uh, start with definitely some definitions. Yeah, and this little car, uh, yeah, you will see it randomly. It happened while I'm developing my uh, my presentation. I wanted to try something and it stayed there. And uh, whenever you see it, you will know that uh, it's just a random thing. It has no uh, really purpose, but you can count them while I'm doing my presentation if you want. Um, a crisis could happen on all levels, global, national, organization, and personal level. When it comes to global level, um, there are definitely a lot of labels for, for uh, crises like that, health, economic, and financial, environmental, and more. Uh, definitely, it's, uh, we all now live in one of them, it's especially the health, and it, you know, health crisis will lead to economic and financial crisis. So uh, actually, we are witnessing this kind of crisis currently. On the national level, unfortunately, the political uh, reasons, uh, conflict, greediness of leaders, and so on, uh, and, uh, the bi and the civil war and the bilateral conflict uh, be, uh, among uh, countries could lead to the sad uh, uh, situation, which is a crisis that will uh, be paid by the human, uh, not by anyone else. So when it comes to organizational, uh, you can see that there are different types, different uh, sort of uh, crisis like financial, ethical, technological, and natural disaster based one and more definitely and just selecting a couple of uh, uh, types uh, on the personal level uh, develop, uh, developmental existential and uh, situational they are also part of uh, crisis on the personal level uh, definitely it's not our talk today to talk about personal crisis uh, i'm not going to talk much about global and na national i'm going to focus on the organizational one however uh, my talk today could be generalized on all levels, so you can always, uh, whatever you take from this uh, uh, presentation, you can still uh, see it and map it to on personal level as well, or even national level, because it's uh, in the end I'm showing you an archetype, a model, a template that can be applied on all levels later on, but today I'm going to focus only on organization one. And since I'm uh, focusing on the organization one, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, definitely the corporate uh, crisis and its definition. And if you look up uh, the literature, you will find a lot, a lot of authors and scholars who were very excited about this topic and they try to find um, definitions. But if you look up all of them, you will find that they all agree on the main part, which is maybe this one. Crisis is a low prob uh, probability, high impact event, short term, undesired, unfavorable, and critical state in a company which has derived from both internal and external causes and which direct endangers the further existence and the growth of the company. So this is the problem of crisis that we don't pay attention to it and we think it, if it comes, it, it's really to come. And But we know as well when crisis comes and the low uh, probability event when it happens, in many, many situations like this, it comes with high impact. 
and relatively it's a short term because in, in if the company will survive uh, this short term was enough to uh, really lead the, uh, the corporate to be uh, not anymore in existence. So, but uh, we have to, that's what we know, that sooner or later, every business would be confronted with crisis of some sort. Um, uh, most of the time, the causes, consequences, the solutions, even to crisis are unclear to anyone, yet uh, stakeholder uh, must act quickly anyways. Um, uh, what's really also interesting when you uh, go ahead and uh, go through literature, you find out uh, cultures uh, in the past because crisis is not uh, uh, an issue of today, uh, not of yesterday, not the last hundred years, but uh, uh, crisis have been there for thousand years and many cultures, uh, they, um, uh, they perceive uh, the crisis in different form because they were living in different contexts. So some of the very old culture, they found it as a severity and road. Some other culture, they see it as a trigger of change for better or worse. Some other culture, they see that, okay, why should we take decisions if we don't need it? And there is no um, urgency for that. But crisis, when the crisis comes, comes with urgency. So decision will be made. Uh, some cultures as well see it as, uh, as, as its uh, danger, but also they see its opportunities. Um, also, you can find that there are uh, some authors who agreed on some traits of crises. Um, crises are starting point of uncertainty, uh, calamity and changes, and sometimes very, very uh, bad changes or even could be very good changes. Crises are detrimental or menacing for organization and stakeholder. It's where it could be the end of uh, this era of the organization. Crises are behavioral phenomena because it's uh, as you're going to see that it has to do with human being a lot, and it's also behavioral phenomena. Uh, crises are part of larger processes rather than just discrete events. It's not isolated; it's connected. It's connected to our past. It's connected to our future. So it's not just isolated island. Um, um, there are, as I mentioned before, a lot of scholars who were very excited about crises, and this is one of them, Shivastava. In 1993, he wanted to um, some sort of conceptualizing uh, the uh, or operationalizing the, uh, the crisis uh, in four C's. Uh, talked about causes, consequences, caution, and coping. Uh, you can see, uh, I'm going to focus on mainly on caution because it has to do with how to prevent or minimize the impact of potential crisis. So this is my talk today. It's about before crisis, not during the crisis, because coping is part of uh, uh, crisis management. And my talk today is not about crisis management. It's about how to be ready for a crisis, because we know that crisis is coming anyway. Uh, the only thing, it's a, it's a matter of time. And here again, that's our uh, uh, friend. Uh, lack of crisis uh, preparedness. W uh, was uh, one of the very important subjects for many authors. And I'm going to share with you one of uh, the studies. Uh, and I uh, mentioned here the link. You can always go ahead and uh, see more details. And it's an interesting study. Uh, they claim that around 80% of business around the world believe that uh, they are only 12 months from potential crisis. So we know that crisis is coming, uh, but we pretend that they will not come today, they come in 12 months. Although uh, despite of this fact, they still 54 have crisis plan in place. And then the study wanted to share with us some of interesting uh, findings uh, when they wanted to see how people reacted when they uh, interviewed them uh, based on uh, what was their reaction and responses uh, 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 when they talk about being prepared. So those are the most uh, dominant four uh, responses. The first one, uh, 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 some of the executives said a crisis plan would be rarely needed. As, uh, some they said um, it would be too difficult to set up or manage, so why should we do it? Uh, it would be too expensive and other, um, other matters were higher priorities. And they shared with us some statistics like this, and you can see Definitely can expect in this study, um, many responses came out, but they focus only on the highest four. And you can see and you can guess, you can smell from this high, uh, highest four, the people are very, they are in denial. They don't want to face it. They don't want to be even prepared. 
Um, some also from the same study, um, they wanted to share with us uh, the highest five reasons uh, that uh, could lead to um, a crisis to happen or to trigger tri a crisis. Uh, controversial company development like uh, 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 retrenchments or uh, cost reduction, very massive. Or maybe it, it is attributed to logistic difficulties like the transport problem, the del delivery problem, or maybe some uh, uh, defective issues inside the plants of, uh, uh, of uh, manufacturing or maybe contaminated part. And uh, some are attributed to technical accidents like the natural disaster, it's occlusion, and definitely it could be also digital-based uh, problem. And they shared with us as well the, uh, the percentage, and it tells you here there are definitely uh, more and more reasons, but those are the most uh, uh, important and dominant five reasons. Uh, when it comes to uh, who was the responsible for uh, creating the crisis, they found that the managers, they knew about it, they knew there is something there, but they didn't take action. So that's why they found out 50% of the crisis, it's because of the manager who uh, happened not to take it seriously. So 50% managers were responsible, 32% employees were responsible, and 18% for some other reasons. But you can see it's 80% plus, 80 plus percent uh, being attributed to uh, human error or human being uh, issues here. Uh, benefits of crisis planning. Uh, they uh, wanted to see uh, how uh, um, companies were affected um, based on the impact of crisis. They listed here only four, but there are more impacts, but they wanted to see how a company who had planned and the company who hadn't planned uh, for crisis, uh, how the impact uh, uh, or how they were impacted. So they wanted to look at the revenue, the retrenchments, uh, the cutbacks, the, the repetition of the company and the, the stabilization of the company. And they found out that uh, when they compared the companies who were uh, uh, had plan in, in place versus the one who hadn't, they found out at least this example, uh, that uh, companies, 30% of the companies who had planned the, because revenue will be hurted anyways, but only 30% were, um, got uh, dropped in the revenue while 41% uh, the, from the, the no plan companies, they got uh, really impacted by the revenue. And you can see here uh, in a very, very quick that uh, the dark orange color versus the light uh, orange color, the dark one means that uh, these are companies who had plan in place, so they are the less impacted. So that means everyone will be impacted anyways, but uh, the one who had planned, this is the message, will be less uh, uh, impacted. Um, again here, now I'm gonna really switch to um, the important construct that I always, I will, even if you ask me to invest, uh, to, to talk about something, I will uh, talk about time. Time construct is uh, really, it's very interesting uh, to talk about it while we are not really uh, have time to talk about time. Uh, why? Because it's intangible. It has some characteristic here. It's unseen. We don't see it. It's like ghost. It's like mirage. It's fixed. That means it has scale. We have to have scale. Uh, the only difference between me where I'm located here and you where you are is the time zone, but we can always, uh, it's a fixed scale. Uh, the only difference is the time difference. It's constant. It's like train it travels uh, with the same speed. It doesn't stop. It doesn't even wait for us. So if we think we have to uh, sail, uh, wait, wait for anything to happen or wait for time, time will never wait for us. So we have to align our life to the time dimension. It's very deterministic, it's very predictable. What does it mean? It means if it's now on my watch, it's 9 uh, a.m. or 3 a.m. 20 in after one, exactly one hour, it will be 4.20 or uh, one hour exactly. So it's, it's very predictable uh, and it's endless because we don't know its uh, start, we don't know even its end. Uh, we cannot extend it because we don't know how it will end and we don't know where, where is the end, but maybe we can expand. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, very soon. Endless, while it's endless, it's scarce resources and we cannot get it back. Once it's gone, it's gone. So we have to go on. Um, one of the things that I want to show you in the next few slides that, uh, uh, believe it or not, 
uh, that uh, uh, each company and uh, to get your money and your look at your business model, you find out that uh, every business model has a time component inside it. Uh, and it's uh, our life, it's all about to monetize time, to materialize time. Materialize time, that means time has, um, is being packaged in a product, but we are selling time, something like that. So this, this is my point today. So I don't want really to talk much about that uh, in my talk because I want to not to deviate from the mainstream, but think about it. We are packaging time to be something to sell and monetizing. Um, then let me make this funny comparison. This is the iPad storage. This is exactly my iPad, I have to be honest with you. Uh, and you can see on the right-hand side here, this is the capacity, 128 gigabyte. Used, I used already 119.8 uh, gigabyte. But if you want to see how I used this amount, you can see the distribution of uh, things I uh, used here. So it's being aggregated or uh, defragmented to look, to look like that. But you can see here at the end here, there is still space. I can get space. Not only I can get space in storage, I can even extend uh, my, uh, my storage. Maybe I go buy more storage. I can uh, even um, yeah, uh, delete part of my messages or my other part here and I can get my storage back. So this is so far, I can go and buy it. I can pay money, I can see storage. But if uh, you look at this, when I tried to make this uh, funny comparison, I uh, use, what about my eye time in my life? So this is, I have to be honest with you, this is my age, 58.7. That means very soon this year, I will be 59. I used 58.7 of my life that I don't even know. So here it's, I, I don't know how many years left or even I don't know how many seconds left. Um, and then, but if you look at the, if I defragment my life, we know if I am, sleeping eight hour per day, then one third of my life will be sleeping. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, dedicated some of my time to the team in Germany that I am a fan of. It's uh, Borussia Dortmund, but unfortunately it was kicked out yesterday from Champions League, but still I will uh, be fan uh, for the team since I was in Germany. Uh, my family here dedicated time, unfortunately it's not much, but I have to do more about that if I have more time to do it. And my study, my work, my travel, uh, Starbucks takes time for my time uh, when I had the, uh, the, the time to go and Netflix now it's even more. And the rest of my life, I think I can categorize as nonsense. The thing is you can't even, if I want to have more time, how can I do that? I cannot go buy time. I cannot go any shop to tell someone, give me more two years uh, or even I don't, I cannot really even, uh, um, delete the Starbucks and I get this time back. It, it's not possible. So it's very, very important to see that uh, the, the, the I time became very uh, important here to see how we are doing this. Uh, this will uh, help me to put my point here. Imagine this is the bar of my time and uh, just to gauge and measure it. And imagine that I want to go from A to B uh, to make some shoppings and I have only um, limited time in my nonsense time maybe uh, and then i want to go ahead and do it so the question is if i don't know whether i'm going to do it or not there are a lot of activities and the time is limited so in order to make my uh, to be, make the or to achieve all what i want to do i have to be faster the only way to be faster is to get money because maybe i take instead of walking Maybe I take Uber, I take my car, and in the end I have to allocate money. And money is going to give me time. Uh, by mapping, it's not direct because I cannot go and buy time, but I can go and get more time or expand my time through mapping. This through mapping, it's uh, like I cannot extend it, like you can see here, I cannot extend it because I don't know if I'm going to live another hour or not, but I can expand it. The only thing to can expand time is to increase the capacity of time by paying money. So uh, even you can even make shopping online, but again, it's, uh, it's money to be paid in order to uh, make the best use of time. Uh, the, the message here in this latest story is the time capacity, we can only 
uh, expanded if we have money, but not direct. We have to map it through some other object. And in my case, it was about car. And definitely our friend will be jealous here. So the question is, uh, the issue is, we can always have money only to uh, monetize it in order to gain more time. So this is how we do it every day without maybe knowing. But by doing this, we expand our time uh, by doing this concept. Now let me go ahead and uh, link this concept into crisis. Crisis goes through different stages, the pre-crisis time, uh, the crisis itself, and the post-crisis. And there are a lot of uh, associated activities. Uh, for instance, in uh, pre-crisis time, we always uh, try to be uh, to detect any signal, uh, any any sign for 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 uh, for any uh, crisis to happen. Uh, we may be, be busy with preventing it, to prepare for it. Uh, in crisis management, uh, in, during the crisis, we manage, we respond, we react. In post crisis, we try to recover, to evaluate, and prepare for the next. Unfortunately, this is not happening. Uh, recovery, maybe we are very busy once the crisis is done. We try to recover from it, so but we don't really invest enough time to evaluate. We don't prepare for the next one. Uh, maybe we are good in crisis management, and there are a lot of books, a lot of uh, uh, instructions for how to manage, how to respond, how to react. Uh, but when it comes to pre-crisis, which basically the my talk today is, is we don't really see the signal, we don't prevent, we don't prepare. So this is exactly my point today, and why to how to be prepared for a crisis. Um, to make my point here, I need to show you the life cycle of any business or even any product or anything, but let us focus on a uh, company only, um, especially when it comes uh, goes through different episodes uh, of, uh, of the crisis. On the vertical line, I, I, I write here state of the system, which is basically as a KPI. And KPI could be financial or non-financial. Non-financial could be like an index about customer uh, satisfaction, and it could be definitely a lot of uh, financial KPIs. Uh, you can always put that. And since I'm talking about time, and I see time is very important, and we are living in time domain mostly, then I want to show you what's happening here across the time. Uh, basically, the first part of uh, our life cycle we call it introduction, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really focusing now on startup, but uh, usually you've got uh, some low sales, some high cost, and definitely a little bit of profit, if no profit at all. The second episode is uh, talking about the growth, uh, where by your sales increasing, the cost will decrease a little bit, and some profit will be happening here. And this is a very good uh, 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 phase uh, while uh, after the growth you come to the maturity episode where you get really be you will be a little bit relaxed because you can really plan you can really predict where you have constant sales reduced cost and profit it's getting better and better uh, and you will not uh, definitely everyone will not like this one the decline decline it's like like our company is going to vanish. Um, if you try to let, you can see them uh, all all episodes. If we zoom in a little bit, they will look like that. They are not smooth. They are just this is the zooming out. But now, if you zoom in, you will find out that there are ups and downs. And as long as these ups and downs are within limit, we are okay. We can survive any downs by uh, uh, turning around and uh, we come back. The problem is if. Uh, the, this one of the downs comes to a certain point, exceeds the limit, the allowed limit, then then it will be very dangerous. So we should have taken some other um, uh, actions to uh, repeat the introduction and growth, ep uh, growth episode to uh, not to go through the decline. So definitely uh, this point is uh, this area, this is not what we want. We want to definitely the uh, part that is going up again. So the question now, which is very, very important, when you look at this life cycle, you can ask the question, okay, so if I know that there are four episodes and I know they have a little bit of starting point, end point, and I know when to fall and so on, why, why I can't really control this one and how to control it? So the question is who is, who is generating this dynamics? Who is generating this life cycle? 
So this is the question now. So I want really to see how we go from, from, uh, from organization structure like this. And the question is uh, whether this structure where have a business function like uh, human resources, sales, marketing, finance, and accounting, they are linked together, but they are linked through processes. They are linked through workflow, uh, but whether this link and this structure uh, can give me the explanation of the dynamics on the right-hand side, this was my question. But for me, uh, when I see this structure, it's fantastic. It has its own benefit, but for me, it's like X-ray. X-ray where X-ray can look uh, to show you the bones, the structure. Yes, you can see fracture if there are, but they are not showing any dynamics. The same as ultrasound and as, uh, as well as the MRI, they don't show us any dynamics. They are very static picture. They are important, but they don't really contribute to explain what's happening on the right hand side. For that reason, I want to see my business as a system, not as a structure. Uh, and not as a static in order to see its dynamics. In order to show you this, I want to see uh, uh, sometimes uh, we, that's the iceberg uh, concept, you know that we always deal with events, we don't deal with the matter itself. We always on the surface and we react to what we see, unfortunately. We don't question why it happened and who is responsible for that. We basically deal with events and not with the root causes. So uh, this is typical behavior, as you can see here on the right-hand side and above here. It's basically um, 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 a behavior over time of someone is reacting. Why? Let us see how I see this reactive mode going. Usually we are seeing problem, but we see symptoms of the problem. We don't see the problem itself. And we have two options, either to solve the symptoms or go deeper to, uh, to solve the, uh, the, uh, the root causes by finding fundamental solution. Uh, usually we go to the symptomatic solution because it's easier and we, it's easy to get problem solved uh, very quick. Uh, and we don't go to fundamental because it takes time. Imagine that you have headache and uh, you know taking uh, pain relief, it's easier than to stop your life and go to the doctor because doctor is going to ask you about uh, a lot of uh, analysis uh, and it takes time until the doctor will write a, a prescription to solve your fundamental problem. Uh, and you know that uh, going to the doctor will be the best option to solve your problem for good, or maybe at least for a long lasting uh, episode, but yet still you are using the symptomatic solution because it's easier, it's faster. But the problem is we don't see other effect, which is the side effect, we don't see it. We just see that the pain relief has uh, helped to, for my headache to be gone, but we don't see the side effect. The problem is the side effect always works in the hidden, in the back end, which will make the fundamental solution in the future became very tough to find. So when even you go to the doctor later, after very, very long time, the doctor will ask you why you came late. If you came uh, earlier enough, uh, I would have solved problem easier. The cost will be less, but now it's too late. So, but uh, this is why uh, still we uh, are in addictive mode because we are became addicted to the short uh, term solution. We are addicted to pain relief. And this is what I call it in our business firefighting. Every one of us is going through firefighting all day. Why? Because we don't have time to go to the doctor. And uh, this is on the left hand side is the archetype of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of reaction and reactive mode uh, and addictive mode. So this is a bad one. This is not, I'm gonna show you the one that you need, which archetype you need to really use in order to be proactive and not reactive. But before doing this, since I'm talking about system, why not to introduce to you the definition of system in order to bring you on the same page where I am. It is a collection of parts that interact with one another to function as a whole. Examples could be like a mechanical systems, environmental systems, social economic system, biological system, ecological systems, education system. Uh, everything can be categorized system as long as it follows uh, the same definitions. Uh, system thinking is the way. That's why I want you to think about our business not as a work of flow and process only. I'm not saying not to but I'm saying plus you have to think as a system. Uh, and this is here a very quick 
facing problem or issue, I told you before, we tend to look at the surface and assume that the dynamics around us are linearly. While it's not linear, it's really, really very uh, nonlinear. Uh, so accordingly, we think very linear and very simplistic. Uh, our problem could be very complicated. That linear thinking is not enough. So we need to think in a nonlinear way. And this nonlinear way, it could be um, what I'm introducing here today is the system thinking. Uh, so uh, thinking in system promises long lasting solution while thinking linear will only solve the uh, problem in, uh, in, in short term. Uh, one of uh, yeah, the, the system thinking, if I want to define it, I'm giving you two here uh, uh, statements. One of them is uh, you can see system thinking as a paradigm, as a methodology for dealing with complex situation. Uh, like crisis, for instance, it's a very complicated. The human being body is also a complex situation. We can still use system thinking to understand what's happening inside us, but let us focus now to the other uh, systems like business, economics, environmental, scientific, and social system, and socioeconomic system. All of them can are systems and system dynamic, system thinking. I mean, uh, it's a paradigm, it's a methodology to help us to conceptualize and understand, operationalize everything to see the dynamics inside our business and our system in this case. It views the organization as a whole and focus on the interdependency and links between various departments, functions and divisions and how they impact each other and uh, the entire organization. So it's a holistic uh, view. It gives us a very interesting, this is the zoom out very uh, the zoom out to look at it because whenever we are zooming in uh, to a very local problem we get stuck there we don't see the bigger picture it's always very good uh, idea to step back and say hey wait let us uh, zoom out a little bit and see the bigger picture and system thinking can give you this interesting uh, picture I'm, as i'm going to uh, show you in a few seconds uh, i like this slide because it's coming from uh, a professor at MIT, his name is Peter Senge. He wanted to make a very big distinction between a problem solving and leverage. He was a fantastic professor and he's a very good author and researcher. Uh, he introduced the uh, learning organization through his fantastic book, The Fifth Discipline. Uh, and uh, he wanted to make difference between problem solving and leverage because we used to use always the word problem solving is a very important skills. Yes, indeed. But when it comes to bigger picture, problem solving is not the matter. Leveraging is the matter. Why? Because he sees the problem is not isolated. It's not unstructured. Uh, it's a short, uh, problem solving is about short term. It's local. You solve a local issues. It's only local pain. It's very optimal because you solve only one single thing. It's neat, but it's only solve the uh, uh, symptoms. But when it comes to leverage, and this is what he wanted to make this distinction, it refers to action and intervention that can have lasting impact on system. It's long-term, it's global, it's fundamental, very realistic, and it solves very, very the root causes of any problem. So today we are going to talk about leverage, and I'm going to show you the difference in my archetype between problem solving and the leveraging uh, intervention. System thinking, now I'm going to show you how I'm going to build very quick uh, system thinking for any organization. Again, it's a holistic, so details can be added on later on. So I'm giving you a template, not the details. Uh, system thinking, uh, or it, uh, in order to see the dynamics, it has three components. Uh, the feedback loop with, uh, with its own, uh, with the two important uh, feedback loops. We have always positive feedback loop or negative feedback loop. The positive feedback loop, we usually call it reinforcing. Uh, why? Because its behavior, you can see here, down here, uh, the horizontal line is time, the vertical time is the state of the system, which is the KPI, and we will all be very happy to see this behavior in our business, like the uh, number of customer, number of project, a number of uh, the money in, this is fantastic, but it's very bad when it comes to, uh, to crisis like uh, COVID, number of infection increasing uh, exponential. So reinforcing it's not good and uh, it's not about good and bad. Uh, I, I mean, it's positive or negative uh, feedback. It's not about good and bad because positive could be good, positive could be bad, negative as well could be good, it could be bad. When it comes to negative feedback loop, it's uh, we call it balancing. Why? Because some terms, uh, some people they like to call it goal seeking. What does it mean, goal seeking? It means once the uh, 
uh, our TPI reach a certain goal, certain target that we already put, then it stays there. It stay uh, stagnant there, uh, stabilized there in equilibrium state until some other trigger comes to disturb it. Uh, so balancing, we need both of them in our life. Uh, but uh, if you can imagine how many feedback loops in our life, they are infinity. But we are not going to pay attention to every feedback loop because it will not be realistic. So usually we try in our business to find the dominant loops. We call it like that, the dominant feedback loops. And today I'm going to show you the three dominant feedback loops that you have to pay attention to them, uh, whether they are reinforcing, whether they are balancing feedback loop. But believe it or not, there are hundreds, thousands, millions of feedback loops around us. But if you just focus on the three in a, in, in a, in a, in a holistic uh, format, you might find really solution for uh, uh, other problems. Uh, again, the ingredients of this feedback loop is what we call it the cause and effect. And this is the second component of our system thinking. We have a, a cause and effect uh, between two, two only factors, two variables, uh, whatever you call them. There is a positive, feed, uh, sorry, a positive cause and effect where both cause and effect goes in the same direction. When cause increase, effect increase. If cause decrease, uh, decreases, effect decreases as well. But also we have on the right-hand side uh, the negative uh, cause and effect polarity, and they both uh, work in, a, in, a, uh, in an opposite way. Uh, as an example for a positive uh, a cause and effect, when you increase marketing and sales, you increase revenue. If you increase quality of service, you increase customer satisfaction, right? So, but when you go here, when you decrease cost, uh, when you increase cost, decrease uh, profit. So uh, there are many, many, many cause and effect in our life, but just to give you an example to just to understand how the dynamic will work. And the last and third component, which unfortunately it's not being paid attention to, it's called delay. Cause and effect will never happen at the same time, even if the difference uh, between cause and effect is nanosecond, it will never be zero. So delay exists, delay is realistic, we have to find it. And there is no just in time. Just in time is nice term, but in the end there is time always uh, between uh, action and reaction. And here's our friend uh, proves that it's still there. Uh, let me talk now about collapsing model and how that life cycle is being created because I told you how I wanted to use system thinking, system dynamic uh, to explain the dynamics. Uh, now think about only two factors, uh, let us call them cause and effect, to show you what's the meaning of uh, feedback loops. So usually uh, if you start from left hand side here, customer acquisition rate, if you increase customer acquisition rate, then this will increase your business, you will increase your customer, right? And the more customer you get, people will know that uh, about your product and more people will come to you. This is a fantastic uh, uh, feedback loop. This is why we call it feedback loop. It's all arrows goes in the same direction. And I call it R, R for reinforcing. And this is a positive feedback loop. This feedback loop is responsible for this part, the exponential part. So if you have, uh, if you have this loop in your business, you know this, uh, this feedback loop is responsible for this part of the dynamics. And uh, then, but uh, that would be a dream if our business increased like that. But we are limited, limited because for each business, for each project, you need resources. Resources after time, yeah, maybe at the beginning, you don't feel that you are running out of resources, but you will. The more business you get, they don't have enough resources. So you have to think about it. Anyways, resources, you need resources. Why you need resources? Because you need to um, work on uh, customer acquisition through maybe business development uh, effort, maybe marketing and sales. So you need resources. Resources could be money, it could be people, it could be anything else. But in the end, you want to trigger more effort in order to get more people. And this is what I call B1, the balancing loop. Uh, why it's a balancing loop? Because the increase of business will still go ahead and increase, but in decreased rate. So that means the first part here, it's uh, increasing with increased rate. But the second part here, the B1 here, is increase with decreased rate. So far, so good, not bad. We like that. The three episodes they are being uh, uh, maintained by only two feedback loops, one reinforcing and the other one is B1. Uh, but remember, if you are going out of resources, you have to have reserve. If you don't have reserve, you will not be there. So if you don't have reserve, let us see this scenario. If you start to get from your reserve, and this is the bad news for everyone, imagine that you have saving money 
and for the time of crisis, you don't get enough income, then you have to go to your account and to take from your saving. This is exactly what's happening now. If you still you want to survive, you need to get more from your saving. But what's happening here? You are triggering the monster. I call it the monster here because this is, I call it the B2. And the B2 is uh, the uh, feedback loop that will be responsible for the collapse. And I call it monster. I think someone, if uh, I may say someone should uh, uh, mute their microphone would be nice uh, because I see some, back, I hear some background and I think most of our uh, participants hear the same uh, background. So anyways, I will try to focus here. Uh, so B2 is the monster and I call it monster because uh, once you trigger it, uh, then, then the collapse will happen anyway. So if we know now that the collapse, it will happen if this feedback loop will be triggered. It's like, you know, at the beginning it was not there. It's like silent, it's sleeping. It's, it's, it's not triggered by any means, uh, but suddenly we take some actions or something happened in our life that uh, immediately this feedback loop will be dominant feedback loop. I think I see who, yeah, uh, I, I think I may, no, I don't know. I think Gloria, I think, if you Gloria, uh, I think you, because it's, you mute your mic if you please, because I really have a little bit of a problem to focus here, uh, especially I'm trying to um, catch the time on time here. So anyways, I will keep going. Anyways, this is the feedback loop that please uh, pay attention to it. It's always not triggered. I tell you this, it's not triggered. It's always sleeping. But if you know that it's sleeping, don't trigger it. It's, you know, don't play with the monster. And I will tell you how to do this, right? So now let me show you how to do this. So now I replace storage with the term carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is our reserve. Carrying capacity is... Uh, the, the saving, if you want to, to show that. This is where we save our, our, uh, our resources for future. We don't use them now. Don't use them. They are just your saving. Now let us see again our timeline here. This is the current capacity. Imagine current capacity at uh, our current current capacity at this level, at this dotted line. Then let us see how our R will work. Our R now is going to create this part, which is the state of the system. Uh, with a number of clients, maybe money, maybe satisfaction, uh, does it matter now? And then B1 works as usual, like that. Then so far so good, right? But once we reach uh, the level of carrying capacity, that means we start to trigger the monster, then the carrying capacity will go down, which will take us down if we don't take an action. The first action we have to take, if you look at the left-hand side here, number one, the first action you, ha you should have taken is to slow down consumptions. So that means sometimes you need to say no for your business. This is the no word. This is slow down. Don't make more business now. It's not wise to make more business. You need to slow down. But whether this is enough at this last moment to do it or not, the system will collapse. And the second one uh, on the right hand side here at the current capacity side, you see building up current capacity is the very, very long lasting solutions here. What's happening when you increase your carrying capacity here? Look at this uh, orange line here. This line will go up. And what's going to happen for uh, the collapsing time here, this line, look at this line, it's going to the right side. That means what we did here by increasing the carrying capacity, the dynamic will change. Immediately, our collapsing point will be postponed here. And if you want not to collapse soon, increase it more and more. So this is how you shift it. So the key point here is the current capacity is long-term solution. This is what Peter Singer called leverage. Leverage it means you have to build up your current capacity while you have still to do short term because if you get pain relief, you need still uh, pain, uh, sorry, if you get headache, you still need pain relief before going to the doctor. So probably we have only two intervention points as you can see in this system and maybe I bring it back here to see that we have two intervention points to our system. This is the archetype of being proactive. Being proactive, it means you need always to build up your current capacity. Uh, current capacity doesn't need always to be money, 
It doesn't always to be uh, only people. It could be anything else. It could be tangible. It could be intangible. In the end, something will let you survive. And uh, this is the long term. Uh, and this is the leverage that uh, Peter Senge talked about it. And on the left hand side, this is the short term and the problem solving. That means you might say again, no for your business. For sometimes you say, no, we don't make enough uh, uh, more business because I don't have enough resources until I build my, uh, uh, my uh, carrying capacity. And you can imagine a lot of companies, they buy companies because of their carrying capacity. If you think about it, why company A bought company B? Think about it. They always think about B, uh, they have a carrying capacity. Think about all purchase happen from Facebook to Instagram to uh, WhatsApp. Why? Because of the carrying capacity and so on and so forth. And uh, you can see that. So this is the main issue. Don't trigger this one. Build up, this is the advice, build up your current capacity. Don't trigger the monster. And then, then every, the survivor pattern, they will be like that. They go to the three episode. Uh, I mean, the first one up and growth. And then before going down, they trigger another wave, another wave, another wave. This is the survivor that means we're gonna really go through that, but they will never ever tr trigger the monster, which is the B2. What are the carrying capacity I meant here? Carrying capacity could be your health. It could be your cash. It could be in a company digital uh, uh, digitalization or digital transformation. It could be your knowledge, your skills, your experience. You need to build it up. It could be innovation engine of any uh, business, the product design process and department, being resilient, being agile as uh, Darwin and Spencer mentioned, and your know-how and your patent. All of these, they are buying you time. So by now, I think I finished my presentation and I hope you got the point how to be proactive uh, with that, with the system thinking. And I will be uh, now, uh, maybe for the last time, yeah, this is our car, but uh, I will be waiting for your question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waba. Um, yes, indeed, let's uh, start with the Q&A session. I just uh, submitted the questions uh, to you. Oh, okay, let me, <laughs> uh, on the chat, right? Yes, that's, that's right. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, I, uh, okay, let me see. Oh, uh, where I can find them? I don't see them in my chat. In the chat, uh, to I send it to you directly. Haven't you received it? Uh, okay, let me see from you. Uh, when? Okay. No. Uh, for some reason, I see still uh, the chat from uh, the participants. Uh, okay. Well, you can also uh, well what I up. What I can do is just submit and all the questions to the general chat, and then you can answer them from there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so we go to question one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, let me see here. I will put the word question one up front. That's more easier for you. Yeah, uh, if, uh, you question will one. You see it here? Responses should ideally go to the pre crisis. Question one. Yeah, okay. okay. Let me see here. Responses. Okay. Uh, Ah, okay, a response should uh, ideally go to the pre-crisis part. Yes, uh, that's uh, as we will need to prepare a countermeasure for all identified risk, once risk. Yeah, uh, yeah, if uh, if this is uh, from uh, George, uh, I think, um, um, is. once uh, a risk or, yeah, risk management, you mean, if this case, yes, definitely, it should be identified, it should be mitigated and uh, uh, it will be part, you know, uh, that's a very interesting, if I want to make a link to your question or your co uh, your comments here to my slides, uh, I always, in order to manage your risk and mitigate your risk, usually you will have less uh, problematic with risk when you are focusing on your current capacity, uh, whether you are investing in your, uh, your know-how, investing in your people, 
uh, you always have to think about that, about, uh, uh, about uh, carrying capacity, because carrying capacity will help you a lot in managing and quantifying uh, and mitigating risk. I'm not sure if this, um, yeah, this is before, definitely pre-crisis time, so. Okay, and I will now submit the second question to you. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, here it is. Uh, unless George sees that I didn't answer, then he maybe can repeat, maybe I misunderstood the question, I don't know. Okay. Question two. Okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Let me move to my next question two. Yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, the overreacting and um, underreacting, uh, it's a very interesting point, to be honest here. Uh, thank you for that as well. Um, to, um, yeah, how um, I see that they are highly overreacting for crisis. It depends on the nature of the crisis. If a crisis really helps, yeah, sometimes being overreacted is not really a bad idea because, you know, I, I don't want really to bring the scientific talk now when I talk about hypotheses. You have always um, the problem you have in hypothesis testing. If you have a theory and you want to prove it, uh, what's the worst situation? Because you have always two problems or you, two, you have two errors in your decisions. Uh, one error when you, you think uh, that, uh, that something happened while it's not, and this maybe you call it overreacting, and uh, the other one is underreacting. So you have to weigh uh, uh, in which situation the overreacting is least problematic. So overreacting and underreacting is not good at all, I agree, but uh, overreacting and reacting is contextual. So that means it depends on the crisis. So sometimes underreacting uh, is also could be good in some situation, it could be bad. So basically I have to say it depends on the formulation of your theory and the claim and the nature of crisis. So when it comes to health, uh, health crisis, I feel like overreacting is better than underreacting. I'm not saying overreacting is good, but it's much better uh, or less, let us say, least problematic than underreacting. Okay, thank you. I feel we have, I think we have time for one or two uh, last questions. I will now submit the third one. Okay, uh, I, because you know, while I'm talking, uh, I'm scrolling, I don't, ah, yes. Yes, question three now, I see it. Please give a practical example of iceberg regarding the distribution of covered global. What kind of thinking process? Ah, yeah. Thinking process can be used and change the part. Yeah, uh, look, it's a fantastic question about uh, uh, a practical example of iceberg. Uh, you see, um, when it comes to uh, a crisis happened already, so uh, system things will not help anymore here. Uh, you can help. That's why this is why I was I was very uh, careful when I said the the topic is about next crisis. But now, if you talk about COVID uh, crisis, um, the system thinking here it's uh, reactive mode. It's reactive mode. There is no problem. The reactive mode is exactly what I showed you in the iceberg slide. I showed this is the reactive mode. We are now trying to react. Now the vaccination came into place. Uh, I'm not saying this reactive, yeah, but um, still. Uh, we have two intervention here. Uh, we are in the reactive mode anyways. The proactive mode was, should have been taken earlier uh, before, or at least uh, we, if we learn from this crisis, we can prevent the next one. The problem of uh, what happened in this crisis that could have been at least uh, minimized its uh, impact, bad impact, we were, uh, from healthcare perspective, we were not ready. Uh, our political uh, system were not ready. Our data breaching rules were not ready. You can see we were not ready in many, many aspects uh, because we needed data. We needed definitely data, but we can't uh, break uh, the, uh, the, the, the rules uh, unless we go through some bureaucratic things, but this is not now. So if we learn something from today, all our, you know, COVID told us this, all our theory are wrong. So we need to change that. We need to create new cells. You will not be amazed that the next era which very, we are living in, you will find new cells coming in our, for our organization. New cells, old cells, old standards are wrong. And now we are new page for new standards and new cells. So I, I feel like uh, 
This is why at some culture they see the good and bad in crisis. The good thing about crisis this time, uh, it uh, really gives us the opportunity to be better in the future, to improve our systems, whether political, economic, financial, and above all, health and education systems. Uh, today it's reactive mode. You cannot minimize, uh, you cannot uh, uh, avoid it. It's reactive. So I can, it's a reactive uh, archetype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Waba. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, we are over time. Um, I would like to thank you all participants for being here. And if there are any questions that we haven't been able to answer now, um, please feel free to send them to me by email and I will approach uh, Dr. Waba and ask if he's able to uh, answer your questions via email. Um, Dr. Baba, thank you very much for your time. I think it was a very inspiring presentation. And goodbye, everybody. And we hope to welcome you again in one of our next online masterclasses. Thank you very much, Wendy. It's where it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for organizing this. You were a very great help to me. And thank to all participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.